Sisters, welcome back to Christchurch for this next session in what we have called the food for the journey, this exploration into this many-sided mystery, which is the Eucharist, the heartbeat and life of the church. Indeed, we can say it makes the church as it takes us as close as we can to who Jesus is and his divine purpose. Now, in the in the uh, session last week, um, Oh gosh, there's a blowfly in here. Well, I suppose all of God's creation can give glory to God, even blowflies. Um, anyway, there we are, excuse the distraction. In the last session, um, I spoke about using your imagination. Let your imagination touch and meet the reality. And this will be so as we make our journey to the altar itself. We've been in Galilee, do you remember? I spoke about the ministry of the word. We are with Jesus as he teaches. Uh, you remember uh, uh, St. Peter says, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of God. It's revealed to him, it's there in Matthew's gospel. And we've said the creed, which is the church's reflection on that great truth. We have prayed, we shared the peace, and now we are setting our face with Jesus toward Jerusalem, Galilee to Jerusalem. This is essential. The gospel makes that clear. Uh, even here last Sunday, the gospel was Peter trying to distract Jesus from his vocation. He must go up to Jerusalem. He must die and he must rise. So we're making a journey. Now, I want to take you somewhere first. We're in the Lady Chapel here and I want to show you something which uh, is not normally seen, but actually takes us to the heart of what, what we are doing in this Eucharist, even in the words of Paul, as we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Not just his death, but its saving work. So, Javi, I want you to follow me, if I may, to this side of the Lady Chapel altar. Uh, and I'm only going to reveal one part of it, but here it is. So come close, Heavy. An altar worth its salt, if I can put it that way, will have these marks on it. It's one of the things that distinguishes it, of course its purpose primarily, distinguishes uh, an altar from an ordinary table, for there are five of these. Can you imagine where the five, the number five comes from? It comes from the five wounds of Christ. That is, those that pierced his hands and his feet and of course his side. So there is a cross here and a cross here, one in the middle here and two more. And this is a reminder of where we are going to, if I may put it that way, when we go to the altar, which uh, Ignatius of Antioch, who died in 107 AD calls the altar of sacrifice. That's what he calls the table at which the Eucharist is celebrated in his writings, all that early on. You know, sometimes people um, call me old-fashioned and um, I'm happy to be so. We are old-fashioned people. We fashion ourselves according to the traditions of that beauty that is both ancient and new as Augustine calls the Lord, beauty, ancient and new. And it fills me with absolute joy every time I celebrate the Eucharist to know that if Ignatius of Antioch or Justin Martyr, who gives us the first description of the whole Eucharist in about 150 AD, if they could somehow be transported and be present, 
Remember what I said about the saints last time? They are present in the whole company of the church. But if they could be transported in some way and be physically, if I let me say it that way, could be present, they would say, ah, these are my people. These people in Christchurch, Brunswick, are doing what we do. They too are obedient to the Lord's command. They too go to the altar of sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice of Christ. So remember, next time you go to the Eucharist, what is tucked underneath the frontals and the fair linen cloth, which itself actually is traced with crosses, what is underneath. This is not simply a table, it is an altar, the place where we recall, remember, the one true sacrifice of Christ. Once, only once and once for all, his precious life he gave. And yet in every Eucharist, there is a making present of the one sacrifice. Indeed, we can say we join Christ as his body, united in his self-offering. A little more of that mystery later. I'm going to uh, go to another place in the church now um, to show you something that is uh, a fairly new addition to our church here, but also reveals something that is very important as we think about going to the altar. So brothers and sisters, I've asked Havi to come up with me um, to uh, this icon, which we now have in the church here. Um, because I think just a little reflection on it, on it will help us um, understand a little bit more about the mystery of what happens um, with the bread and wine, actually, on the altar, in the high point of the drama in this service we call the Eucharist. The, this icon, uh, the original, uh, is probably 6th century, and it comes from, it's to be found in the St. Catherine's Monastery in Egypt, which, by the way, just reminds me that that's built on Mount Sinai, and um, uh, near the place traditionally of the burning bush. Remember that um, wonderful story from uh, the book of Exodus and Moses was told to take his shoes off because he is on holy ground. And I was just reading that the Armenian Orthodox bishops, when they come to celebrate the Eucharist, they take their slippers off and celebrate without shoes on for the very same reason that when they draw near to the altar, they're, they're drawing near, they're on, they're on holy ground. Anyway, um, um, the icon uh, is a very interesting one, Christ uh, Pantocrator, Christ the Almighty. And uh, it, it was painted at a time after or even during reflections about who Christ is, as the church over hundreds of years actually tried to put into words the experience of Jesus Christ. What, what was God revealing of himself in Christ Jesus? And it, it reveals the dual nature of Christ. If you look at the face, you'll see that there's a, they're asymmetrical. One side reflecting uh, the divinity of Christ and one his humanity. And my point is this, that, that when we're looking at Christ Jesus, the church came to the conclusion that you, you could not talk about him as human and separately as divine, that in him there is this dual nature this is, this is a jumping of categories, in a sense, because the holy God, the spiritual, uh, it, it, it becomes material. And the spiritual and the material are fused, that's a bad word, fused together in Christ. So you can't, for example, say, well, uh, Jesus had a day off from being divine when he went to um, a Mary and Martha's place, you remember the window there, um, and relaxed and put his feet up, that he was being human then, and then when he was doing his miracles uh, uh, at the resurrection, he was being the divine son. No, the, the two are together, as together as can be together. And it does not make any sense to divide the two if we're to understand Christ Jesus. The material, uh, the human Jesus, is, is divine. Now, th this helps because it seems to me when we start to reflect about the bread and wine and uh, what it becomes for us, 
uh, we say it's the body and blood of Christ. Uh, it, it, it just, with the same principle, if I can put it that way, it just doesn't make sense anymore once it's been consecrated. Some of the early fathers talk about this. Once the invocation of the Spirit has come down on the gifts, the bread and the wine, and, and actually the priest will often use his hands like this, uh, it no longer makes sense to simply say it's merely bread and wine. Even if what we see with the naked eye is bread and wine. And, and some of the um, fathers of the church say, try not to worry that what you see is bread and wine and what you feel and taste is bread and wine. See with the eyes of faith. Surely in the same way that the one who dug the spear into Christ, the ones who took his body down the, from the cross roughly, just saw a man with their naked eye. But in fact, they were handling, handling the body of Christ. Yet they could not see. And which just reminds me, I think it's Cyril of Alexandria. I think, no, no, it's Augustine of Hippo, who reflects about the mystery of, of Jesus at the Last Supper, holding his very self as he holds the bread, which he says is his body, the body of Christ holds the body of Christ and hands it, offers it to the disciples. That's worthy of a bit of um, spiritual reflection, I think, that profound mystery. Of course, as we make our way now to the uh, altar and leave the icon behind, but remembering that you cannot divide the humanity and the divinity of Christ, uh, we'll walk now uh, down to the altar. It just reminds me that you will know that the that the phrase body of Christ is used in a number of ways biblically um, to talk about the reality of Christ and the experience of him. So we talk about the body of Christ being formed in the womb of Mary. We talk about the body of Christ uh, uh, walking about God's earth, the body, it's a physical body, and it is the Christ, you are the Christ. We speak about the body of Christ on the cross. We speak about the body of Christ dead in the tomb. We speak of the body of Christ being raised from the dead. We speak of the church, that extraordinary community that is formed of Christ as the body of Christ. That's how Paul typically speaks of the church. And he uses very fleshy language, soma, the body of Christ for the church, which can, of course, um, is filled with those of us who are here now, and as I've said already in this course, those whose images are in our stained glass windows, the, the whole company of Christians, uh, 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 men and women through the ages. And of course, we talk about the body of Christ in the form of bread and wine. You, or you would be forgiven uh, for asking, as indeed has been asked through history, through history, how can the body of Christ have this so many forms? Where's the cohesion? And I think, I think, it's helpful to think of the cohesion in terms of the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit is the agent of Christ's coming. Remembering, of course, that in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is at once the Spirit of the Father and the Spirit of Christ. So the Spirit overshadows Mary at the Annunciation and she is filled with the presence of Christ, which begins in such a tiny way with that zygote or from the moment of conception. Uh, it is the spirit that, as it were, raises Jesus uh, from the dead. It is the spirit of glory that is present even as his body dies on the cross. It is the spirit that, that comes on the day of Pentecost and animates uh, the first disciples and the church is born, or, or you might remember the words of Jesus from the cross, as he hands over his spirit, many commentators, commentators say, he hands over his spirit to Mary and John at the foot of the cross, who become, as it were, the genesis of the church. The spirit, the spirit. And similarly, you, 
are filled with the Spirit in your baptism. And now in the Eucharist, traditionally, we have what is called an invocation. This is much more evident in the Eastern Church, uh, who live with mystery much more easily and, and don't just think things are changed by words, if I can put it that way, though words are not unimportant. But what happens to the bread and wine is that the Spirit, send your Spirit upon these gifts to make them holy. It is the Spirit of the Lord that, as it were, overshadows and fills these material things. Remember, Christianity is a materialistic religion. John of Damascus in the 8th century says, I, I do not worship matter, but I'll never cease from reverencing matter because for my sake, uh, God became material in Christ. We believe, Christians believe, that uh, the spiritual things can be manifest in material things. Remember, the spirit, the divine, and the material have been, we might say, restored in Christ Jesus. And so the spirit descends upon the gifts to make them holy with, of course, the words, and this is almost true of every single Eucharistic rite, as we call it through history, I think with just one exception that we know about, where the words of Jesus are at the Last Supper or also spoken. And uh, in one of our um, Australian uh, rites of the Eucharist, by your word and spirit, may they become the body and blood of Christ. The word and spirit which allow the word made flesh to be manifest and present in the mysterious way in the bread and the wine. It, it, it's not time or appropriate to spend a lot of time, it seems to me, on, um, musing too much about the mystery of that presence. For me, uh, what is crucial is the idea that it, just as it becomes meaningless to speak of Jesus as human and divine as it's somehow separate. So when I look and think about the presence of Christ in bread and wine, I'm to find him there, to know him there as they did on uh, in that inn or wherever uh, on the Emmaus road. They knew him in the breaking of the bread. And this becomes one of the means by which uh, the church experiences Christ's presence until he comes again. Uh, John Henry Newman very beautifully uh, speaks about that in the, in the sacraments, um, we fall under the shadow of Christ. Now actually, uh, what's true about a shadow is that a shadow has to have something really there in order to cause the shadow, if you understand. Uh, in fact, this candle is even now um, uh, casting a shadow on this altar cloth. And if I take it away, there is no candle there, there is no shadow. Newman says that there's, it's the presence of Christ. We fall under his shadow in sacramental encounter. And so we come to that part of the Eucharist, I might say the high point of the drama. We know we need the ministry of the word as we journey from Galilee to Jerusalem, of course. But now we come to what we might call the high point of the Eucharistic celebration when the feeding is to happen. And it's done in a whole variety of ways, of course. And... Um, at the altar table here. Uh, we use incense um, and in some of the writings of the fathers again you'll find them uh, talking about um, uh, that prophecy in Malachi that all the nations uh, will offer praise and incense will be offered up. Remember uh, what Christ does is unite Jew and Gentile. All the nations are welcome. 
all are united in this new community, which is the work of Christ, this new communion of which this is the food. Um, uh, now, before we go on, let's just listen to a song. So brothers and sisters, uh, that great overshadowing that uh, uh, Newman talks about, Ambrose says, um, uh, a blessing is said and the elements are changed. John of Damascus says, um, uh, in the bread of the Eucharist, we experience the divinity of Christ. And so I just want to show you, because normally when you're at the Eucharist, you're perhaps in the congregation, and you don't see exactly what goes on at the altar, because it's full of uh, symbolism, it's full of ritual actions, which are a lovely thing, if I may say, not just for a congregation, but for a priest, uh, uh, as, as the priest is reminded that actually they stand in the person of Christ. Uh, Newman says this, uh, before he became a Roman Catholic, as he uh, preached as an Anglican, he said, remember, it is Christ who baptizes. It is in reality Christ who presides at the Eucharist. After all, the priest who is set apart for this purpose will say, this is my body, this is my blood, the words of Jesus. And um, just to say there's uh, some uh, interesting, um, uh, uh, not controversy, but difference of opinion about whether when the Eucharist is celebrated, the uh, the priest, the celebrant should adopt this, what is called the westward tradition where he faces the congregation. Or whether, uh, let me come around, where, where the, the celebrant faces east. And uh, facing east is a symbol of looking toward the return of Christ who traditionally will come from the east as we look forward to that day when of the consummation of all things, when he shall return. Um, sometimes people think about that eastward facing as the priest turning, um, excuse me, their back on the congregation. That, that is not the point. At that point when the, when the prayer is said, and we'll come to this in a moment, actually, if you think about it, the congregation and the celebrant are all facing in the same direction. It's not so much that he's turned his back on the congregation. And in any case, if it's westward facing, let me say something I've said to every single person I've ordained to the priesthood over the years. Uh, uh, of course, that was when I was ministering in England. A good number of new priests, some high church, some low church, some middle of the road church. And I've said to them all, when you celebrate the Eucharist, what matters is that you pray it whether you're at the north end or whether you're eastward or westward facing, pray it. It's a prayer, not a performance. And if you pray the prayer, if you unite yourself with the self-offering of Jesus, which we remember, the sacrifice of Christ, if we are pleading his sacrifice, if you pray it, there is all a possibility 
that the people assembled will hear the voice of the Lord, bidding them out of love to come and feed. Well, as the altar is prepared, uh, interesting, I talked about the physicality of things. This particular um, piece of material is called a corporal, which we get the word body, because on it will be placed the body and blood of Christ. And, and this, as it were, uh, forms a boundary as the intention, whatever is intended to be consecrated and blessed and set apart, is placed on this corporal. It's a place of intention. And just quite often, just to say, it's a rather private thing, just occasionally I will um, spiritually in my own prayer tuck a particular need or person who I know to have needs, tuck them under the corporal um, uh, with that lovely closeness, mysterious closeness, as the Eucharist is offered. And then um, the bread um, is taken and um, some prayers are said, uh, sometimes out loud, but sometimes perhaps if there's a hymn, um, these bear great resemblance to the great Jewish prayers, the Beraka prayers, the Thanksgiving prayers, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer. Remember, we have nothing of ourselves to offer. This bread has been made with our cooperation. Nevertheless, even our work is an opportunity and gift. Through your goodness, we have this bread to offer. And just think of all the hands that have been made. It could be a loaf or in this particular um, uh, uh, bread. Uh, the number of people who have been involved in its manufacture, in its delivery, in its people in the shop where it's bought from, or the nuns who make it. Uh, uh, human beings cooperating as bread is taken. And blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, through your goodness we have this bread to offer, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. And the response, blessed be God forever. Through your goodness, this bread, it will become for us the bread of life. Who is the bread of life? Of course, there will be a time when sacraments will cease. But until then, and though they asked the question of old, what does he mean, John 6, what does he mean to say to us? We must uh, eat his body and blood, his very self. How can this be? It has to be trusted in the same way that when Mary said, how can this be? When she is told what is to happen to her, how can this be since I know not a man? That's a question of logistics rather than a question of doubt. It can become for us the bread of life, eternal life. Medicine of eternal life, it's sometimes called. Then, in this lovely chalice, this is a gift of mine, uh, just to say, in the Eucharist, the marvellous thing is that the whole created order, have you noticed, is involved. All in all, the whole created order is involved at this moment in worship. This beautiful chalice fashioned out of the stuff of the earth, bread and wine, uh, the living world, ourselves, men and women, and of course the invisible world of angels and saints, all focused on this altar with one purpose. Isn't that a lovely vision of God's hope for the world? One purpose, one adoration, all, the whole of the created order gathered, even in Christ Church, Brunswick. And then wine and water is mixed together. Uh, water flowed from the side of Christ uh, on the day of the uh, uh, Passion when the sword pierced him. Wine and water are placed in the chalice. And then another prayer of thanksgiving, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, Eucharist, it means thanksgiving. Blessed are you through your goodness. Notice who I'm talking to. I'm not talking to the congregation. I'm talking to the Lord. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have this wine to offer. Years and years ago, when my youngest brother was walking on a pilgrimage to Walsingham with us, he wasn't a Christian, but became one. 
we were worshipping every day in church halls and village halls as we made our journey five days walking to this great place of pilgrimage. Having relaxed and informal worship, breaking bread every day, Bible study, my brother said to me, you people talk as if God is listening to you. Indeed we do. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer, fruit of the vine, and work of human hands. Notice that cooperation. Do you remember at um, the Sea of Galilee when uh, uh, Jesus is on the beach, this is a resurrection story, and he's cooking some fish and, and he says to the disciples who've been fishing, bring some of your fish, throw them in the pan. In a lovely cooperation, the Lord, had, well, he, of course, he'd provided the fish, uh, the miraculous catch of fish as surely as he provides the wine and the bread. But he deigns to say, come, come, cooperate with me. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. And people say, blessed be God forever. And then the priest will say a prayer quietly with his hands down. Lord, be pleased with the sacrifice we offer you with humble and contrite thanks. And then he washes his hands and uh, we prepare uh, for the great Eucharistic prayer. Now, we're not going to get through all of that today, but I'm just going to, uh, uh, as it were, uh, whet your appetite with that um, first uh, part of the prayer when the priest is actually talking to the congregation. Uh, it gives us a clue of the direction we're traveling in. It's called the Sursum Corda in Latin. The Lord be with you and also with you. Then lift up your hearts. Remember I said in the last session that one of the early prayers in one of the rites said, up with your ears. <laughs> we have the with the Lord. Lift up your hearts. And actually, this is important. It shows the direction we're traveling. We're looking heavenward. We're looking towards the eternal banquet we will share in. But also, we are exposing our hearts as we pray. This is a heartfelt prayer for all of us as it meets the Sacred Heart. Heart speaking unto heart. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. The word Eucharist means thanks. Let us, let us give thanks. Our sacrifice of thanks and praise to the Lord. It is right. It is surely right to give our thanks and praise. And when that lovely dialogue between priest and congregation is over, then the direction of the prayer changes. And this we'll look at in our next uh, session. For the prayer from then on, with one exception as the Eucharist continues, will be directed to our Heavenly Father with the same purpose with which Christ Jesus himself offers himself to the Father on the cross. Brothers and sisters, um, <laughs> we've been going for some time and we haven't traveled far yet in our ritual, our liturgy, in this many-sided mystery. But there is enough for us to be getting on with as this Prayer will take us into a time when bread, wine will be united with divinity. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless. Now bless, Lord, the wine you have given, and give joy to this our world that is thirsty. Those with one give thirst for true justice. Love.